think. Fantastic. Ah, yes. But is it second? It doesn't, me. Yeah, it doesn't actually tell you when it's live sometimes. I'm just going to keep an eye on that. Yes, yeah, uh, Zoom's telling me we're live on Facebook. Oh, gosh, no, we're, we're live on Facebook. Hello there, everyone. Sorry about that. It's, um, it's always a bit of a weird one with Facebook Live. I guess I'll get more used to it in the future, but this is one of the first times I've, I've actually done a Facebook Live, believe it or not. I've done lots of Facebook interviews, but usually I record them and then upload them. But this is just a way for me to be just that little bit lazier. Sometimes I think in life, you know, being lazy is a real skill. What do you think, Peter? <laughs> There's a lot to be said for it, if you can get the technology to work. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, I'm Adrian Warnock, and you're joining us for the very non-professional interview, much more relaxed. I don't know if you did get yourself a coffee, Peter, but you're very welcome to if you don't. Ah, yes, you see you've got coffee. I haven't, but that's how I like to do these interviews. I'm joined today by Peter Linus. Have I got your name right? You have, Peter yes. Linus? I spelt that right. Um, from the Evangelical Alliance, and uh, we're here to talk about a rather exciting and encouraging report that we read this morning. So uh, just to give you the headlines, essentially 70% of UK churches are growing at the moment, despite the lockdown, despite the fact that our buildings are closed, the church isn't. So Peter, would you like to just talk a little bit more about, about that for us? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, we thought, look, we need to find out what's going on. It's a strange space that we're in as the Evangelical Alliance, working with churches, church are in this huge change. So what we did was we had a put out a survey uh, and we said to church leaders and organizational leaders, look, just tell us what's happening and a whole range of questions we have. But the big headline for us was, uh, as you were pointing out, 70% of church leaders are saying more people are coming to their church who would not normally show up. Not only that, so we thought, well, maybe that's just Christians doing some church hopping. Um, but we dug behind that and said they're, they're interested in Christian faith. And we're seeing an interest in people making a first time commitment. So across a number of measures in the response, church leaders were saying, um, this is an exciting time. It's been hard work to get everybody online and to shift yeah. when we're doing church. But actually, people are checking it out. So why do you think it is that? I mean, what, what is it about uh, church that is making people want to come at the moment? I mean, I thought church was boring and, you know, smells and bells and dusty and, and you know, something of the last century, not the 21st century. I mean, well, well, why I, do you think that is? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I don't think we know the answer fully from the survey, but two things. We also rang all of our members. We've been chatting to lots of church leaders. So two things I think have come up. One is what's going on in culture. So for the last three months, all we have read almost every day in our newspapers and on the news headlines is how many people have died, how many people have this virus, how bad life is. And yeah. it, it's all true, but that's very depressing. And we are not wired to get that level of negative information just constantly coming at, at us, particularly about death and our own mortality. So people yeah. are, I think, looking, hoping, please tell me there's something more. And then churches have been agile. And as somebody said, there's never been a better time to sneak in the back door of church so before people buy something, they'll tend to look at it online. Before you go on holiday, you'll check out where you're going. Before you buy a house, you check it out. But we didn't make that very easy with church. So somebody says, come to church. You're like, I don't know what that is. But now we put it online. People go, oh, OK. So we've made it much easier for them to come and check out church. And they want to do it because, frankly, they're a little bit depressed by the just constant narrative of our culture at the minute, which is death and depression and a crisis and a pandemic. And they're like, yeah. please tell me there's some relief. So people are starting to check out church, Jesus, prayer, buying more Bibles, searching all these terms. It's a fascinating time. That's really interesting, isn't it? I, I think probably I might sum all of that you just set up into one word, hope. Uh, it's been something that's really been sort of resonating with me a little bit. Um, just personally, really, because you put on the news and it's so, so easy to become an armchair politician or even an armchair scientist and say oh it's obvious you know we should have shut the airports down maybe with that retrospect we should have but you know probably it would have been too late because they're now saying that there were some people who who had the disease maybe even as early as december in this country so it's like you know we, we probably couldn't have done that quick enough maybe it would have delayed things maybe it would have saved some lives but it's so easy to say that with retrospect and i know some of the scientists were frightened that if they'd shut down too soon that people would give up just at the wrong time when the peak was at its highest. They'd be like, why have we shut down? There's only been like five people with the cases, you know? So what's the point? And then suddenly, bam, you know, everyone does what they're doing now. Um, and actually, you know, at the wrong time, that could have been even more fatal. So I personally don't envy the politicians or the uh, scientists, do you? No, no, these are really tough choices we're having to make. And we're seeing that even in how I'm sitting here in Northern Ireland, talking to you in England, yeah. the four nations are taking slightly different approaches to this. 
but across them all, there is, that, as I think you've said, deep fear and anxiety and the, and the contrast, the antidote to that has to be hope and churches are offering hope. Yeah. Uh, but I don't envy the task of anybody else, uh, politicians um, and other business leaders, everybody trying to navigate this space. This is a tough space. It's been tough for churches. Um, but then we're looking at it through a different frame of reference. We're not trying to solve the pandemic or this issue. We're trying to say actually there's something that beyond that and there's something that values what it is to be a human being in this moment. I mean, the pandemic asks real questions about what it is to be human, how we treat yeah. old people, how we treat those who are lonely, some of the intergenerational tensions. Yeah. We've got the, um, the treatment and how it affected those from the BAME community. Um, yeah. So lots of work being done about why did this virus hit certain constituencies differently? And how do we yeah. as a society respond in a way that said we value everybody? And actually, I don't think we did a great job on that. So again, looking to somewhere yeah. like the church is doing a great work in this moment. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you're absolutely right. It asks all kinds of fundamental questions. Because like, for example, um, I'm, I'm actually somebody with uh, a poor immune system myself, personally. So I'm in one of this you know, extreme, extremely clinical vulnerable group. And, you know, before COVID, I was already needing to be careful about washing my hands. But other people would have probably looked at me and said, oh, you're a bit nuts. Why are you washing your hands so much? You know, you've got OCD, you know. Um, I was sort of having to self-isolate myself for a fair bit. I mean, I would be able to go out a bit. But, you know, flu, flu kills 8,000 people a year or more. Yeah. And yet we do very little to, to try and prevent flu. And I'm not saying we should necessarily lock down, but things like vaccinations. I mean, right now, I think if there was a vaccination for COVID, and one of the hopeful things is that there may be. And that's the funny thing. They're not even talking about that on the news much, but it's potentially going to be September, a vaccine. And if there was, everyone would sort of fall over themselves for it. And yet before people were like, oh, I don't know if I want a flu vaccine. And, you know, it's like kind of so protecting people um, from the flu wasn't seen as a priority. Like we go to work with a cold and we think we're macho. We go on the train and infect the whole carriage with the flu. But now suddenly we don't do that anymore. So what does, does that mean for flu? What does that mean? And suddenly people like me actually feel like, gosh, society at least to try and do something to protect us, which is rather yeah. nice. I think it's really challenged our really profound individualistic culture and said, actually, it doesn't really work. We don't like being on our own and we actually do care about other people and we are prepared yeah. to limit ourselves to go into lockdown, to stay at home for the sake of everybody else. Uh, yeah. I'm not in a vulnerable shielding group, but at the same, my mom is and friends are. And so for that reason, we shield because we were told to, but also because we love them and care for them and therefore want to make sure that they do well in this moment. And so we are yeah. prepared to sacrifice our individual freedoms. And actually that's, so that's one part. And say, we don't like being on our own all the time. You know, I'm an yeah. introvert at heart. I'm an Enneagram five, but even I'm going, please, I just want to hug somebody. I want back out again because we're yeah, all yeah. to be on our own. So it's sort of revealed that the, the profound individualism doesn't really work. That's not our true story. There's something yeah. deeper for relational beings made the image of relational but God and, and everybody has dignity and worth and yeah. that's being challenged by a whole set of stories in our culture right now. Yeah I, I mean just even something really basic which again it, this would have been a huge news story just a few months ago if this had happened um, that one day you know probably literally over a coffee in the afternoon at the Cobra meeting I suspect they said oh hang on if McDonald's are going to shut and um, all these other places are going to shut what about the homeless? Where are they going to like go to the toilet? Where are they going to like get a cup of tea? Um, we're going to do something about them. And they literally issued an ed edict and said, by the weekend, they all need to be in hotels. And it was like, and it basically happened. Something like 80% of people who were sleeping on the streets were offered a place in a, in a hotel. And I know there's a guy, I don't know if you know him, um, Julio Mecki, who uh, he's the, uh, Julio Abraham, sorry. He's the uh, CEO of Derby City Mission. And um, they work with the council and, uh, and the local hotel and are supporting as Christians, um, these guys and ladies that were on the streets. And it's like, suddenly, hang on, we, we're doing this now? Why didn't we do this before? And what happens when this ends? And it's like, what does that say about these people that we've been quite content to just ignore them? But now all of a sudden, um, we're thinking, actually, we need to shield them. We need to look after them. We need to recognize them as, as you say, valuable, even from the state's point of view. But at the same time, the state is struggling um, to get the resources to do that and is looking for volunteers and looking to the church. And one of the things you said in your report, that was that a huge percentage of churches, I think, are working with the local authorities and such like now, which hasn't always been welcomed before. No, it hasn't. So I think, uh, yeah, what we're saying is that 88% of churches are working with the vulnerable in their community, but of that group, which is a great number, but of that group, three quarters basically are working in partnership in some shape or form. So uh, about just over a third, I think it's 35% are working with the local authority or the statutory bodies in that area. Others are working with other charities or with other churches, but I find that really encouraging because I think there's this hesitancy often the church and a perception that the church is reluctant to work with the state. But the reality is 
we are prepared, to, if people are open, most churches are going to work with anybody in this moment. And actually working with the state's a necessary piece because something like homelessness is too big for one small organization to resolve. You've got to work alongside other state agencies um, because there's access to a range of resources and that collaboration can work. The state also yeah. can't solve it on its own. And I think it's beginning to recognize that. And almost certainly going forward, there's going to be less money to spend. And so we're yeah. going to need... Um, the mediating institutions, those who stand between the individual and the state, and the third sector is getting squeezed at the minute. We know that they're down on income. There's there's less money about to give. So the church has this incredible network of people ready to serve, is doing stuff, and will continue to. And I think it's a real moment for the church to step forward and shine, doing what it's always done, yeah. maybe a little bit more and a little bit better, um, but really yeah. then stand out in this moment. Yeah, because you're right. I mean, the church has always had this drive. It does come from what you were talking about earlier, this this passion that people actually matter, that, you know, we're not just the products of, you know, billions of years of evolution uh, and random chance, that there is a designer and that because there's a designer, we carry that that value, that image of God. So it doesn't matter how lowly someone feels, you know, how sick someone is or how, how little they can, quote, quote, do for society or how, how you know, how little we might value them financially or in other ways as society, they're actually valuable because they're made in the image of God and they reflect his image and, and they have aspects of him in them that, that is a beautiful diversity. I mean, my, my pastor was just talking recently in the, in the context of all this uh, obvious um, concern about race, you know, and, uh, he was just talking about the diversity that God uh, has put into his universe. He's created hundreds of thousands of species on the planet and he's made us all different and each one of us reflects his beauty. And I think that perspective on human life is very different from a sort of utilitarian atheist secular view that really can't really find a reason why we should even care if someone dies because why should we care if, 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 if there is no god and there's no value i think totally we've got a larger project called the being human project we're just beginning some work on we've done some podcasts we want this for over a couple of years but it's it's that basic premise of the very notion of what it is to be a human being is arguably the most contested notion in our society from the beginning sure. and end of life to race to disability to things you've seen in this coronavirus crisis but it, where it's kind of exposed some of that again we've said actually the most fundamental idea is what is it to be human i'm a lawyer by background and i, I was interested in human rights law the human rights law is really good at telling you what your rights are it's really bad at defining what a human is it's yes. almost like it's a given but then when you're really pushed and challenged they can't do it because it's yeah. such a fundamental idea and yet we we don't have an agreement of the worth and the value of every human being just reading Tom Holland's book, Dominion. And again, he's saying, you don't get to a sense of equality and rights um, for every single human being without going through the God story. And he's coming as an agnostic, feels like he's on a journey, but he's saying as an agnostic in the story, and he's saying, you can't argue that from any other framework or worldview. It's exclusive yeah. to the Christian, Judeo-Christian worldview that gives sense of equality and rights and dignity to human beings. And I, I think that's, that's a great place to be having these kind of fundamental yeah. conversations with our culture and a real bridge building evangelistic missional point to be doing that dialogue. Yeah, because one of the things which is interesting is we seem to have sort of accepted all of a sudden as a society that, that the value of a human sort of soul is not just something you can put a monetary sum to. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people that would say, hey, we've trashed the economy to save a few old people, that can't be right. And yet no one's really saying that. Now, may, whether they will be in September, October, when you know there's high unemployment and the furlough scheme has been wound up and there's gonna be an awful lot of, I think there's a crunch coming, let's be honest. That, yes. that almost we're being shielded from a little bit because of some of the, some of the government schemes, but it's, it's gonna to get tough. And I guess some people will start asking that question, you know, how much is a life worth in terms of money? And yet somehow that question, if you ask it to a son, or to a wife, or to a husband, or to a daughter of someone who's sick, they'll say, well, no, please, you know, save this person, and, and, and no matter what it takes. And there's been some phrases like that, we'll do whatever it takes. And of course, there has to be a limit somewhere. And that's where we're going to um, butt up against some of that, I guess, as things start to open up. And, you know, there will still be some people dying, unfortunately, and hopefully they will be able to keep that in control. But it's, it's kind of like that huge wave of overwhelming the NHS hasn't seemed to have happened. So now what do we do we allow it to spread a bit or do we try and stamp it out like a few countries have managed and, and and how will the biology help us i mean will the vaccine work or will we see this kind of drip drip of people getting sick and and yet you know um us being us having to um 
somehow accept that and, and live with this new normal and this new level of risk, whatever that is, that's sort of quotes, quotes, an acceptable risk. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's well, I think there are, you were talking about flu earlier and there are, you know, the high rates of death for flu every year. We cannot get rid of all illnesses. And I do think there'll be tensions going ahead between the generations to some extent, because in a sense, the younger generation are ultimately going to pay for this in terms of the lack of education they're getting. I mean, our kids are being homeschooled. They're fortunate. We have a reasonably good education understanding and can do that. And we're doing the kind of sharing a bit to make that happen. But I mean, lots of kids we know in the class aren't getting that. And then, you know, take that up to the university level or coming out. They virtually no chance of getting a job into this climate. So we, yeah. I hope there's not a generation that then gets labeled essentially as the COVID kids who didn't get their GCSEs or A-levels or into uni because of all these things. And that can yeah. sit for a long time. So there could be there could be tensions around that because which generation pays the price in a way. So it felt like in one yeah. sense, we ignored the old and put them into care homes. And I think there are real questions about that. But at the same time, actually, we shifted the whole system in a sense also to protect the old and the vulnerable, potentially at some cost, at least to a younger generation. Yeah. And we'll have to balance some of those things out and have really open and honest conversations about that. And that Which is going to be difficult. I think churches are one of the few intergenerational institutions around that can and set a place for that similar in a way yeah. to race not exclusively but we have done reasonably good job of mixing generations of mixing social classes of mixing ethnicities and so i think we at least should be at the table to have some of these conversations about what are a new yeah. society looks like going forward and of course the other thing from the point of view of the church is that it is one of those places that people reach out to for help whether they're christians or not sometimes you know like if you're sitting in hospital, it's like, can the chaplain come and visit me? Can the pastor come? Or, you know, you'll pick up the phone. And sometimes I know when people have been thinking, even how can I get the shopping? And I found myself saying to people online, just, just ring your local church. There's yeah. bound to be somebody. And if it's not them, they'll know who's doing it, you know, and they'll be able to help. Um, and, and that ability to reach out, to connect and to meet people at, at their point of felt need. So it's not like we always come with the Bible and bash people over the head, you know. Uh, but it is like we say, because of that value that we've been talking about, um, those people, you know, ought to be able to reach out to the church. And often when they do reach out to the church, they find they find compassion. I think back to um, my my youth when when AIDS was a thing and a big thing. I mean, it's still a thing, but it was a huge thing. It had just come out. And to be honest, society as a whole was was treating AIDS patients quite badly, uh, quite abysmally. And sort of it, it was like they didn't want to touch them. They didn't want to hold them. They didn't want to be in the same place because it was this fear that you'd catch it. And of course, fortunately, I remember at the time thinking, isn't it good that AIDS is not quite so infectious uh, as this thing is? And um, but but actually, there were two things I remember, you know, remarkable, of course, Princess Diana going and holding the hands of these yes. AIDS people. But the other thing that was remarkable was the work of uh, people like Patrick Dixon, Dixon and the ASEC yeah. and all of these things. So actually, Christians were doing what they've always done, actually, through the centuries and saying, hey, here's a need. Uh, here's some people that are suffering. Here's some people that are sick and dying and the hospices didn't want them and the hospitals didn't want them and nobody wants to care for them. So guys like Patrick Dixon saw the hole and said, right, we're going to set up places to care for these people. And, you know, you might see, you know, and I know modern society would see a bit of a disconnect. So well, what the Christians are caring for the people with AIDS? Well, yes, they were because they are people that are valued and that are loved. And so that's happening now, isn't it? And are you, what are you hearing from pastors and leaders about that process and what are the sort of felt needs that people might be expressing to their churches that they wouldn't necessarily express to the journalists or to or to the government yeah it's a great question i think that history is so important we got to get better at telling our own story about it as the church and things that we have done and signposting that at this moment what the church leaders are saying are the big issues uh, is concerned about uh, an increase in mental health problems um, yeah. so, I mean, that was the so number you don't hear that on the news much do you i mean nobody really talks about mental health much on the news you know it's, it's definitely limited. Uh, funny, I was just in a church trustees meeting uh, this morning, and that's exactly, they were looking at it as one issue. And I said, by the way, that's the number one issue that church leaders across the UK are identifying. And um, so it's that, and then poverty and debt for individuals. And that's probably less surprising, if you like. Um, yeah, although, like, is, again, I think sometimes people seem to think that furlough's got it all covered, whereas, of course, some people missed out by these furlough schemes, and it's coming to an end, so then... What? Yeah, I think we, we ask churches, but we know across society, as furlough comes to an end, I mean, we're seeing the conversations, you know, how many, is it 10% of people are going to be made redundant, what are the numbers, nobody knows yet, but you can tell firms and others are moving to that, and some of that's inevitable, if you're in the travel industry, if you're in the food sector, where things are not opening anywhere near as quickly, they, they clearly can't sustain the same numbers they had, so... One of the concerns that we have is, is that as this unwinds, what impact is it going to have? Uh, so church leaders are definitely seeing that. And interestingly, the two services that they're most likely, or two ministries they're most likely to have set up 
in the last couple of months are emergency food provision and a befriending of some sort to deal with those yeah. who are isolated and lonely. And again, they're not complicated things necessarily to do, but they're absolutely hitting the point of need. And then they're saying, look, deeper mental health issues are going to be the problem going forward. How do we engage in that? Um, so almost half of churches have set up a new ministry in the last few months, which again, I think is just great. I come from a business background and we love that entrepreneurship. And the church gets a bad rap for being a bit slow and a bit, uh, you know, dirty at times. And maybe sometimes it has been, but in this moment, um, I mean, just about every church in the UK got online within a week or two. And nearly yeah. half have set up some new ministries. Like, fair play, church has done well. They've adapted to this space exactly. that they're in and maybe uh, got rid of that reputation they had for being a bit uh, slow and, and cautious and stuck in their yeah. way. Yeah, and I think as well, I mean, there's been a lot of Christians, I suppose, partly driven by the hope. Because I, mean, I was thinking about this the other day. We're, we're, we face the situation ever so slightly differently to, to the average person. Because we're not just looking at this in terms of the biology and the science and, and whatever all the doctors are doing and will the vaccines work and all the rest of it. You know, we do believe that there's a God in charge of the universe. And, you know, we look back over time and we think about certain other disasters that the world has faced and how God somehow, somehow intervened and brought us back from the brink. You know, like... During, during things like uh, the missile crisis, where everyone thought the missiles were going to go. Actually, God was like, no, that's not going to happen. And sometimes you hear some of the stories about some of the things that happened. You think, my goodness, that was a miracle. That's, nobody pressed that button by mistake. You know, there were a couple of times where it got quite close over those years. And similarly, you know, obviously going back to the war and go, wars and all these kind of things. We sort of think, now, obviously, the world is a mess. I get that. And there's a lot of suffering and a lot of pain. But we do believe somehow that God will, will deliver us from this and that we, this will be in the rearview mirror at some point. I, I think that's a, you know, there's a fundamental hope there that, that there is a God in charge of the universe sort of driving us forwards. And I don't know. I mean, to, to me anyway, that, that seems to be core of part of being a Christian, really. Yeah, I, t I totally agree on that. I think when I, when I, I tell the story sometimes when I was studying to be a lawyer and, and doing that kind of work, people were like, well, if you need that God thing, that's fine for you, but it's not for me. And that was 20 years ago when kind of life was good and it was Blair and Clinton and the third way and the economy was good and politics was good. And then we had the, I suppose, the, the economic crash in 2008 and stuff. And, and even, even, even my law friends were less secure in their jobs in the last few years than maybe others were. And then the politics of Brexit, et cetera, and Trump. And suddenly people were like, well, politics isn't the answer. And, and in this moment, it's like those two are combined again. We're going, well, politics and the economy are completely up, up for grabs. Like nobody knows what's going to happen day to day. Yeah. So suddenly we're again saying, well, that's not the answer. So where am I putting my hope? Uh, and it is absolutely a different story that we're framing. We're saying, look, it's in the resurrection hope of Jesus. This all happened over yeah. Easter. That wasn't a coincidence either. And through Pentecost, the church has been leaning into that. And I do think we, you were really seeing the exposure of that very thin secular story that when we really were faced with death and uncertainty, it couldn't cope. And we're yeah. looking at a much richer, deeper biblical story and saying, actually, I'm not saying this has trite and simple answers but it does fundamentally answer who you are, your sense of purpose in this world, and that your hope is outside of yourself yeah. and something else. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and, and I think because it's interesting, isn't it? Because people often throw suffering like a grenade at Christians and say, well, if there's a God of love, how can this happen? And of course, we all ask that question. It's one of the, you know, the oldest questions in the book. But actually, it's a question we all have to answer, really. And um, I, I recently, uh, over the last couple of years, quite slowly read um, Tim Keller's book on walking with God through pain and suffering. And he he starts off the book by looking at philosophy and theology, which you know he argues is almost like a subgroup of philosophy, if you like, and religion, and saying that actually this whole philosophical debate that a lot of people today don't really think too much about, they just go on with their lives, or at least until now, um, actually that's all about how we handle suffering. And that, that, that one of the most important questions a culture has to answer is what do we do to make sense of suffering? How do we make sense of the fact that some people get sick and die? Some people are not able to work. Some people have awful things going on in their lives. And how do you cope with that as an individual? But how do you also support someone else? And what meaning do you give? What answers do you give when you're sitting there as a friend? And maybe you shouldn't say anything. I mean, Job's friends got into trouble when they opened their mouths, didn't they? But how do you help people or yourself in that sort of situation? Obviously, I've done a lot of thinking about that. And I think all of a sudden, people are, are recognizing something that Keller claimed, which was that our current culture, if you like, outside of the church, in the modern sort of Western world, is probably the single worst culture that there's ever been in terms of being prepared to handle suffering. And I think we've seen that, haven't we? Yeah, I think we totally have. 
look, I, totally. My own dad uh, passed away in, in November time, and I was really close with him. And he got what looked like a stroke and then a tumor, and it was a there was a little bit of a journey. But what was fascinating? So he loved Jesus. We loved Jesus, a family. So I mean, we were able to navigate that. But what fascinated me was talking to other people. So you could see those who were Christians and knew he was a Christian and said, "Look, we're praying with you, and we're there." And then I could see those who knew we were Christians, but were less sure. So they were kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm pre- praying for you. But there was a little hesitancy. And one part of me wanted to go, really? And then the nicer part of me was like, that's good. I want to just encourage you, even if, even if I think you're maybe struggling, but great. But then there was this third group who would say, I'm, I'm thinking of you or I'm wishing you well. And I could almost sense that some of them said it, but there's a certain emptiness because... It's like your story basically believes he's a random collection of cells. He's about to dissolve away. You, you wouldn't ever say it that way, but you don't believe in anything else. You don't believe what I believe. But at this moment, you don't have the courage of your convictions to say anything more than I wish you well, which you know means nothing because you don't have any frame for that. You don't want to say I'm praying. Fair play, you've at least had the honesty. You're not going to pretend, but there's nothing else. And I can feel the shallowness of your words in this moment. And we had some, few inter- I, I posted a bit around that. And we had some interesting interactions with folks around that because I think it's yeah. true. They just don't know how to process suffering their own or anybody else's. And then we've seen that kind of writ large as a culture that just goes, I don't want to do with 40,000 deaths. How do you, how do you process that every single day? You can't. And so one, some people do turn to the church. Others just go, Poof, and we see these blow ups on Twitter and all around the place. Cause people are like, ah, I'm struggling with lockdown. I'm struggling with death. I'm struggling with suffering and I have no answers. And it's exposing the shallowness I think of their story. No, I think you're right. And so no wonder, I guess, that in that feeling of, of angst, maybe not being able to sleep, worrying about whether they can get food, you know, some people, they're reaching out to either an individual that they know was kind to them in the past. And that's, that's where I think Christians have, you know, done a great job in many cases of investing in relationships over years. And uh, I know of some people, I was just talking to recently, who, who actually, they would never have thought that this particular friend would go to church. But now, you know, because of that relationship, uh, they were able to say, look, you know, if you want, you can come online. And it's such an easy thing to just click a button. And they see then, oh, actually, there are other people that like my friend. But these guys seem like they know each other. And even in the manner of preaching, it's not so formal. It's certainly not negative. It, this guy seems to have a relationship with somebody that he, he values and, and, and he knows God. And, and, what, and they're just drawn in, I suppose, partly to the community and partly to, to that sense of, of hunger and need for, for spiritual meaning. Yeah, I was talking to a minister and this was in a much earlier stage of the crisis. And uh, so he had some nurses in their congregation and they were saying that they were going to the prayer meeting and they said to some other nurses in the hospital, and this was at the very strict week, two, week, three bit. And the yeah. other nurse said, do you think that's something, could, could we come on to that? And it, they were doing it on Facebook. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, you're more than welcome. Like this might be a, a slightly bizarre way for you to engage in enter church. But they just said, we need something. We're just... I think it was the oppressiveness in that moment of the real lockdown in the hospitals, the day sure. in a real sense. And they were like, can we just come to the prayer meeting and just sit and almost hang out and <laughs> and be yeah. a part of that? And so he was just like, it was the most interesting, not your not your kind of root one you would think in evangelism, come to the prayer meeting as your way in. But actually it's what they needed in that moment it was just something that sensed, that again, there was something more going on. There was a place you could share these things and watch people talk to God, which doesn't sound like a great evangelistic strategy, but actually was really perfect in that moment. Yeah, I guess that's right. And it is, as you say, just this idea of hope. I mean, that's such a crucial thing. I, um, y- years ago, uh, Toppy and I, the, the guy who passed the church I'm in, uh, wrote a book together called Hope Reborn. And um, it was a book to summarize the gospel message. And because we were looking for something to give to people in this kind of position, the sort of person who's coming along to church, and is interested but doesn't quite understand or maybe even is saying i want to become a christian but what is a christian you know i don't i don't get it and so we we, uh, we were looked around at the time for a book that, that sort of helped people in that kind of right on the borderline sort of position and we couldn't find one so we wrote one uh, that's actually here by the way just a little advert blah 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 but anyway um i'm only saying that because it's a very cheap thing and it's something that i've certainly been able to give away to people myself recently um who've, who've wanted to know a little bit more there's, there's a uh, person i've known for a long time who who now is just suddenly asking the questions and where before they would never have read something like that. And of course, there's lots of other books. There's Nicky Cumble's Why Jesus. There's all sorts of um, other useful things that can be used. And I think there's an opportunity because people have got time to read or to watch yeah. a sermon or to, or to join an online alpha group or whatever is the thing that's right for that individual. Maybe for some people go to a prayer meeting, but whatever is right for the individual is the point. And we've, we've, I guess we've got to have those tools in our toolbox and, 
and know what ones to use. Can you think of any others that would be useful? Well, I think the online alpha is a fascinating story because a friend of mine, uh, Shayla, who runs online, uh, or sorry, runs alpha in Canada, and they were the ones who really pushed for online alpha. And Nikki, by his own admission, was really quite reluctant about it and just couldn't see how it would work. But he eventually allowed them to do the kind of youth videos and get things ready and, and have that up and running. And now he's a complete fan. He's running online alpha groups and saying, I'm, I was so wrong. This is the best thing ever. And one of the things he said was, from what you were saying there, was that people read the books. So they had always had reading in each chapter, but nobody ever read them, he said. And then suddenly now that they're online and people have time, he said, oh, there's one of the guys was on saying, oh, I ordered the first book. That was really good. And he's recommending it. So everybody else is like, oh, I'll go and order that one now. And yeah. so people are exploring and really interested because the online alpha works. The churches who are doing the live streaming, some of them are moving or having it on Facebook so that you can interact easier so that the people who would have been on the welcome on the door are now on the welcome online. See, when they see people popping in, they're just sending them a little message, maybe offering to pray for them, welcoming them. So you have to again get creative. How do you actually engage with people who might be coming in and out of your digital door that you don't recognize in quite the same way? And so again, it's a challenge but it's another real opportunity to engage with people in different ways. And there, there's undoubtedly a receptiveness that wasn't there six months ago. Yeah, so what do you think? Are you optimistic? I mean, look, let's get to the, the nub of the question, which I was, I was gonna ask a lot earlier than this, but we never quite got to it. Are we, potentially at least, at the beginning of some kind of revival? I mean, it's, I know it's hard to label that, but you know, there's something mm -hmm. remarkable is happening, isn't it? I think something really interesting is happening. Only time will tell. I think we're in a season of like potentially very significant renewal and that could lead to revival. And um, I think there's a big reset moment now for the church. So what I would say is that lots of people have the three phases, whatever they want to put on them. We've done the reaction phase. There is now a kind of reset moment and that could happen in two different ways. I think we have to reset some stuff like a broken bone that got, that got broken. Um, but, but we also, sometimes you reset direction, you reset where you're going and that's an adjustment. If we just go back and the real pressure I suspect on ministers now is uh, by September, let's get everything back the way it was. And if we do that, I think we're, we're not going to see renewal and revival. If we just allow it to go back, we sort of wind down our digital services, wind down all the creativity, the exciting new stuff that came along. But if we say, no, this is a reset moment and we need to keep some of our online channels, we will of course get in-person gathering as well, but we're gonna to have to stay more creative. We're gonna to have to stay agile. We did in seven days what would have previously taken seven years. If we go back to the seven year model, dead in the water again. Mm. So I think churches have a big chance of reset. And to be blunt, I suspect some of them probably won't make it through this. They, yeah. they, they aren't able to reset. They're locked on a Sunday gathering and an offering model and a pastoral care and just look after the bunch who are there. But those who are missional, those who are creative, those who are ready to make changes, and I don't just mean the trendy young ones, I mean those who are just genuinely up for the conversation, I think it could lead to some significant renewal. There are people interested, but we've got to disciple them. We've got to keep welcoming new people in. Um, and I think crisis often precedes renewal. It doesn't guarantee it. So we've seen the crisis, and it has been significant in our culture. So I think there's a real opportunity for renewal, and you could say that leading into revival. But, but the danger is we sort of, pack that away and we get through it and just say oh i'm so glad we can go back to what we had before please can i set up the same 16 meetings that we had back in january and if we do that in september i suspect that'll be awful <laughs> yeah and it's trying to get that it's it's understanding what the reset looks like of course there's some things like the broken bone we've got to put back together we've got to find ways to gather but we've also got to keep on that creative edge of serving the community and keep leading people towards Jesus. The one thing we maybe haven't said is in those stats about people coming to church and encountering Jesus, the churches that said it was in their top three things were much more likely to see people both come yeah. along with an interest and actually make a commitment to follow Jesus. Those that said that that wasn't in their priorities weren't seeing it. Now, that's a big question for some churches. Is that not a part of what we should be doing? Um, so only 7% of churches said this was their key priority, but they saw loads of people come into faith and those that had no yeah. interest didn't. So it's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's like kind of, but it's important. <laughs> yeah. Well, cause I mean, I, I was really struck by that when I saw your data, uh, you know, it's like, I think it was something like 60% of churches were praying for people to become Christians. And that's a great start because often let's be honest, we don't even do that. Um, but if you're praying to God for something to happen, I mean, the image I had in my mind a little bit as I was reading that was, um, a bit like when the early church were praying for Peter, let him be released from prison, let him be released from prison, you know, and they're asking God with great boldness and faith. And then Peter comes knocking at the door and um, and, and the lady opens the door and, and everyone thinks 
she's nuts when she says Peter's there. They said, like, you know, they think actually God hasn't answered their prayers. He's been killed, and now it's his ghost at the door. And, and I guess it was a little bit like that because so many churches, although they were praying, hadn't necessarily thought, right, we're going to try and focus our meetings almost not exclusively, but primarily to try and help the, the visitor. Um, and yet those that had were also seeing much more blessing, which made sense. You don't just pray for it, you prepare for it, you plan for it, and you change things in order to actually make yourself more accessible to uh, these people coming in. I mean, it's interesting point is you get what you look for, I suppose. You do, and if that's not a priority to you, then it's going to show you're not going to measure it, you're not going to look for it, you're not going to orientate your service around that being impossible, even to put out the ask and say, hey, if you're here and you're looking to encounter Jesus, this is what you need to do, this is how to pray, this is how to connect with somebody afterwards. If we don't even presume there might be people in there searching, we're not even going to articulate well what it means to be a Christian and to change our language sometimes to explain stuff. We're going to end up in, in kind of jargon instead. And so, again, church have been given a great opportunity, but I was hearing about church even just this morning who had their morning and their evening service recorded and sent out. And I was thinking, how interesting. I wonder, you know, for many churches, they've taken this a moment to say, well, hold on, why, why do we run so many services on a day and different services? In this moment, do we need to be running? Now, some have said, hey, we're going to do a Sunday evening, but do it totally differently type. Sure. Setup. Some are just doing the same thing. We're just keeping everything the same. We've got all the same talks on it. And then we're handing out a CD uh, with all those things on it like gosh that's not the recent moment you're looking for what is that you know if it's on a cd if it's in a closed network if it's in a zoom you can invite others in but it's you, you think how do i get my church service out so that other people can come and see it not just the people yeah. i already know about it all of those things yeah. send signals about the way we want to do church and are we welcoming others in yeah i think you're right and and there's an interesting point um on there that i just wanted to draw out which is about i guess authenticity really and you know part of the whole thing about you know the, the the outreach to the poor and the needy that we were talking about earlier um it demonstrates something about us as people and that we actually do care that we actually are compassionate that we actually do love people but that word authenticity is really really important and um i remember reading a long time ago about something john stott said about billy graham um so i'm sounding old now talking about two old men but anyway um uh, Billy Graham um, came into the into the country in the 50s and there was basically there was some sort of awakening whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it loads of people got saved and a lot of uh, pastors um, who, who would pastor me when I was a child let's put it that way were, were, were saved through those Billy Graham meetings and I'm old enough to remember being in one of them but John Stott went to a Billy Graham meeting and uh, one of the earliest ones and he was like he asked the question he said why is it that people are flocking to hear this guy preach and they won't come to our churches and it's a good question to ask. Um, and his answer is quite interesting. And uh, he reflected on it 25 years later. He said that nothing he'd seen would change this answer. And he said that he believed that for many people, the first truly authentic person who was a believer, who sort of really seemed to just believe it and came across as someone with in integrity and someone with passion and someone with real honesty about them was Billy Graham. And that there was something about his manner that was so open that showed people that yeah this is real so i guess where i'm going coming to all of this is we, you mentioned the word um renewal and it seems to me that there's a bit of a drive um, in many christians at the moment who are themselves obviously being shaken by what's happened and themselves being woken up and 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 maybe who've been a bit complacent with their faith but but now and for me i know this has been true of me personally becoming a little bit more you know engaged with jesus for yourself and realizing actually there is a hope here that i can access you know maybe i do a bit more meditation or whatever uh soul time stuff has been great for that but and listening to worship music or just engaging in more in a more intimate way and a more reflective way a chance to to do the sort of things that the christians of old used to do which we often don't because we we didn't have the time and and get i guess becoming more spiritual have you seen that as well I think I've seen it. I mean, I wouldn't not from the survey, but from lots of the conversations we're having. Absolutely, uh, I think that sense of that the renewal must start uh, at home and personal before it becomes corporate and becomes societal. The, the notion of contending in this moment—that really, yes, praying—and I don't want to minimise, but it just there's a wrestling with our local areas to what it is we put this prayer resource out, what it is to walk the streets and to pray because everything's suddenly more local. I would have travelled a lot in 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 my work for EA but now I don't but now I walk the local streets and I meet people and I bump into them and we chat in a different way and so there's now a slowing down as you say uh, and then a, a, a spiritual we have to actually feed ourselves to some degree much yeah. as online church is wonderful it's very different than many of the other meetings so 
it's that sense of how do we take the time to contend, to go after and to pray for renewal, revival, whatever we want to call it. I mean, we're seeing something really interesting and it seems yeah. like leaders and others are saying this is a moment for authenticity. It's a moment for integrity. It's a moment for, uh, you know, the absolute contending for the city and the towns that we live in yeah. in a different way. Yeah, and I guess for just really re-accessing the gospel for ourselves, it's like, you know, what is it I actually believe and do I really believe it? Now in the face of all this, you know, maybe my family member is sick or maybe I'm sick or maybe I'm worried about something or, you know, I don't have a job anymore. You know, and I, I was trusting that God would provide for me and now he hasn't. So what does that mean about my faith? Am I going to lose my faith? Because some people do when hardship comes. Yeah. Or, or am I going to have a shaken faith for a bit? And then am I going to be able to do that journey that, that Keller talks about, that long journey, which you might need to do with other people, by the way. It might not just be you on your own. Um, you might need people to walk with you um, and actually get through to that place of intimacy with, with God. And a funny actual resource that I think has been particularly blessed, just looking at the, the view counts would suggest that anyway, um, is, a, is, a, is a guy called Terry Vogo, who um, a few years ago, the name everybody knows, and I'm sure a lot of people do still know his name. He's the founder of New Frontiers planted you know thousands of churches across the world as part of that movement um inspired you know whole conferences and, and now of course new day that is led by his son joel and, and yeah. um, that's a big conference um taking over from you know places like soul survivor and those kinds of things that are happening as well lots, lots of things going on but the point i was saying was he's been just putting up like a one minute video almost every day and this is a guy who's walked with god for decades and um i guess he just felt prompting uh, again about this stirring and he just like the, the video today was called the prodigal father and it wasn't an evangelistic video um it was a video for believers really to say hey look you know this this father actually loves you you know and um and just to get get to our hearts so that instead of god being just sort of something we study to get to a sermon or someone we read the bible because we have to do our quiet time to actually try and help people you know on their journey into that into that inner world if you like of relationship with god and for me personally that's been one of the things that stirred me up and thousands of people seem to be watching it so i i'm guessing there must be other sorts of resources that are doing the same sort of thing that are just blowing up here and there i think uh, we see you know and they're doing that on either small or different scale i think the whole you yeah. know since as people said hey look platforms and uh, programs are are kind of out if you like we, we've moved beyond those those aren't working in the same way yeah. and so people are looking for something that has that in, uh, authenticity and integrity yeah yeah because uh, that particular thing is just him they, talking to a camera like one camera you know he's just his it's, i think it's his iphone he just sits there chatting to it for one minute and you think oh i'm with a spiritual father here he's sort of almost discipling me almost one on one now of course i'm sure that's happening as well actually with relationships again and you know when you're struggling to be able to reach out and i guess if someone's watching and they are struggling whether they're a Christian or not already, you know, wouldn't one of the best things we'd say to them is, look, pick up the phone or pick up Zoom and find a friend or a pastor or somebody that you can reach out to and be honest with for once, instead of saying, oh yeah, I'm fine, I've got a Christian smile. Absolutely, I mean, like one of the, we were some church leaders recently and they were saying, they've actually canceled their small groups and people are like, oh, what's just, um, but they were saying because they've gone to smaller three and four person cells, they're like, Small groups were fine for the first few weeks. That was all good. But they said they've either become just one person teaching the other 12 or just social hangouts. And that's not necessarily bad. And people can do that. But they said, we're not getting the kind of openness that we need in this moment. People are being stripped away, but they don't want to reveal that in front of 12, not online on Zoom. Now, that's not going to be the same for everybody. But for a number of guys, they said, actually, what we find is we've gone down to threes and fours. Um, and we're using those in those seasons in a slightly different way than we maybe would have previously. Yeah, interesting. And, and I, I think it's that same notion of people are looking for a safe space. And um, we, we don't get that in the same physical way that we did previously. And, and we do need to make ourselves accountable or engage with those couple of others, be it going for our socially distanced walks or meeting up online just to share some stuff. And, um, you know, people are definitely feeling the pressure. And let's also be realistic even the best was you know if you've got good mental health and good well-being and good relationships this is still a surreal time nearly everybody is feeling some sense of pressure about this it's, we're not wired yeah. to stay in our houses this long and um, to not socialize to quite the same degree to not travel all those things so we all have to expect that we're going to feel some push on this and then there's a spiritual dimension we want to bring into play to that and we've got to have spaces where we can talk about that pray into that and and be kind of mentored by others yeah no i think you're right and i i guess it's really important that we're honest um i i do go to a small group um it's it's not as big as 12 it's not as small as three or four and i guess it's a sweet spot depending on the relationships and all that and um and we we found ourselves being more honest i mean i was i must admit i was in that 
I was in a call recently and um, uh, in the small group and, 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 and the question was, you know, let's talk about a time when you were anxious. And you know, normally, you know how it goes in a Christian circle, because what will normally happen at that point, someone will say, well, yes, 10 years ago when I was a young Christian, let me tell you about a time when I got anxious, you know, and, and of course now I'm more, much more mature and it doesn't happen. So I must admit though, I just, you know, our group's not like that anyway, but I just decided to throw a little grenade and I said, well, you probably expected me to say about something that happened five years ago. Let me tell you about the huge panic attack I had two days ago. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And it was just really refreshing to be able to be open like that. And I, I hope people feel that they can do that. Yeah, I think, I mean, this has got to be a space where that kind of stuff gets stripped away, where we, where we just reconnect with the local in a different way. Um, and I mean, I think you heard it anyway. I'm not saying small groups are bad. I was just intrigued that people yeah. are trying to find new and creative ways to push that where it maybe wasn't working in a different format sure. and saying yeah, we've sure. got, again, to be potentially a little bit agile in this moment and try something and then be prepared to say, Do you know what, that hasn't worked either or that was for a particular season. And, and I don't think any of these guys were saying that was long term. They just felt their particular format and the way their groups were set needed an adjustment. And I like that. You've got to maybe take these moments, be bold, push something. But they were also looking at how you support those on the front line initially. So they were saying, how do we as a staff team in a church initially ring the nurses and doctors on the front line? But then they said, that's no good. How do we release everybody to do this? So what does it look like to make sure we're all caring for one another in this moment in a different way? Because the reality is there are no chaplains in a hospital, but there are loads of chaplains in a hospital. There are lots of Christian doctors and nurses there, but it's a very different role for them suddenly at this crisis moment to say, well, look, there isn't a chaplain, but I can potentially, if the moment's right, pray with you or at least pray for you to the side, whatever way you want to understand that. There are definitely opportunities and for lots of people in spaces, but this is the releasing of everyone. This is the bit that probably gets me most excited is that we're saying we can't just always rely on the clergy and always rely on the ministers. This is the releasing of the scattered church everyone everywhere every day in different places mm. we've got to pray we've got to speak to people we've got to bring jesus into the conversation we've got to care for people and meet their needs we've got to set up the whatsapp group in our street and not wait for somebody to come and deliver that program this is about each of us being the priest or the prophet or the <laughs> in that moment in our space and carrying that mm. role as we're called to be in this not in just in this season. And if this releases and pushes everybody back out and we see potentially smaller staff teams even for a season, but more people ministering out into the community, I think that is what's going to shift the renewal and the revival. It's that readjustment of that framework rather than reverting back to, well, we pay you, so can you sort everything out for us again? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely right. And I guess this kind of disseminated approach and this online approach, but also as we start to redo the face-to-face, the -face, it's going to be interesting for a while, isn't it? How do we... How do we do like a hybrid approach, maybe, for example? Because you might find that some people are really ready to get back to church and maybe the government says we can have churches that are up to 50 people, but you're a church of 100. So what do you do? You sort of maybe some people come, but some people are still watching online. How do you see that happening? Yeah, I think it is. I think going into lockdown was, was tricky, but actually easier in comparison to this coming out so i think you're right we're going to see different speeds we're going to see contesting i think we as christians are going to have to be really um wise about what we say because some churches are going to go ahead i think that's the best thing and that is them serving their neighbor and others are going to say we have to wait as long as possible that's how we serve our neighbor and they're both going to do that with the best of integrity and maybe nuance because of the space that they're in geography the people that they know but we're going to see potentially you know quite conflicting ideas about how we do church what that looks like and we're going to have to give each other grace and say i gotta respect your decision to go that way you know your people we're going to try this way we might even get it wrong so there's there's those things we've got to be alert to as well because i have a little bit of a concern that we might end up in quite a contested christian space with everybody arguing about what's the right thing to do and there's oh yeah we, we usually end up finding ways to argue don't we which is a bit of a shame but i guess you know we need i guess we're going to need online church i think we're also going to need sort of imaginative online sort of community uh, evangelism as well that might not necessarily look like evangelism did in the past so i mean i personally one of the things i've done because uh, we were encouraged to have our own little side hustle you know during this because if you are someone with hope if you are someone who feels that you've got something to offer the world you kind of want to do something you know and, and maybe i can't go into the hospital and um, like i might have wanted to in years gone by uh, for my own health reasons but i can do something and so what i've tended to do is reach out to other people who are facing similar challenges. And I think many Christians are doing this either just informally through their own Facebook or through getting involved in forums. In my case, I set up a whole whole new webpage during lockdown called Blood Cancer Uncensored as a sort of meeting point for people to come and talk about 
in that case, blood cancer and the challenges they've had. And, 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 and we've deliberately set it up in an open way so that believers and non-believers can be there together. And, and the, the believers are free to actually talk about their faith, but also not bash people over the head with it. Whereas the unbelievers, they can talk about how they lost their faith. That's fine. And there's a kind of meeting of minds. And I, I do think that, that there is some of that happening in other contexts. And we, we kind of need to see more of that sort of thing approaching where, where actually we're, we're thinking of imaginative ways to, to reach out and connect in the way we're talking about. Well, I think absolutely, because mission has become essentially normal in that way. Love your neighbor, go and get them stuff from the supermarket, get outside and applaud yeah. the NHS. This is kind of missional moves, but it's become kind of like normalized in our culture. So in one sense, the bridge to being missional has become easier and, and more natural. And I think we've yeah. also shifted yeah. from being the consumer, we just go to church and grab stuff to to being, you know, we, we are being asked to contribute more. Now, there's a danger in the online that you become an even more of a consumer, but actually it doesn't give you enough. So you have to contribute and engage. You can't just rely on that. So if we're going to, if our faith is going to grow, we're going to have to engage more. And so I hope we move away from some of the kind of consumer oriented nature of church to a much more contribution, engaging everybody and again, releasing them out and, and doing exactly what you're doing, setting up an online forum in a space that you understand and you've journeyed through and invite others to come in and do some bridge building in that. And it's like, well, what does that look like for each of us doing a version of yeah. that in our spaces? Exactly, because for someone it might be going onto Mumsnet. Maybe Mumsnet is, is exactly the venue you can already do that. Or maybe that isn't quite right, so you need to start something new. Or, but, or, or you just use your Facebook page or, or, or whatever. Or you set up a Zoom call. I mean, that's another thing. You know, we know we're, we're pretty good at running meetings as churches, let's be honest. But we've become very good at it over the years. So why not set up a Zoom call, you know? And, and I think that could happen as well. You know, if you've got a group of friends who used to meet together in a coffee shop, the Christian might be the one who says, hey, why don't we get together on Zoom? And I think that's been happening in some cases. And again, it's another opportunity, perhaps for some honest conversation and for some openness and just just, just for getting a non-Christian and a Christian together and actually talking openly. I mean, that's a, that's a major step in the right direction, isn't it? If we listen to them and then they're going to want to listen to us, I guess. We were just talking about that, I think, before we came on, about how easy it is to do something like this on Facebook Live. Now, Facebook's yeah. got all sorts of queries and questions, and we need to be careful about all our engagement around it. But at the same time, it's this incredibly simple way to take a conversation out into the public domain or to reach out to people. And so we're seeing people again pioneer, or pioneering, but getting really good at that kind of Facebook evangelism. And there's some for whom that's totally natural. There are others who think that's the worst thing in the world, and they're dying to meet people for coffee, but they're great at that. So it's, again, yeah. finding our sweet spots in that moment using the technology or the ways that we feel comfortable with and that God's equipped us in. And each of us is going to look, it's going to look different in the context that we're in, but we are all being released, equipped and empowered in different ways. And again, it's not us, it's God's Holy Spirit coming upon us. And we're saying, come Holy Spirit, tell me where, you know, help me know how to use my gifts and passions that you've given me God in this moment. So for you and I, that might be more like this kind of conversation in an online forum for other people. That's going to be quiet one-to-one -one on the phone or a neighbor over a fence and each of us is going to do it differently and that's where it gets exciting because if you release everybody into doing that um, and you start seeing instead of the hundred people coming together to hear the one the one equipping and resourcing the hundred to go out to now start engaging with the 10 each that they engage with well wow it starts to get really interesting in the conversations that we're having and of course that was going on before but i think we're starting to see and frame it a little bit differently we're beginning to realize that the sunday gathering is not the be all and end all it's really important but it's to resource and equip us to go out during the week to continue to be beacons and, and uh, messengers of hope. That's wonderful. You know, it feels like that might be a good place to stop. Um, I don't know if we missed anything out. Is there something we should have talked about that we haven't? I don't think so. Oh, I'm what's burning to say... on your heart? Is there anything burning on your heart? Any last closing words to, you know, people who are watching this? Most of them are going to be Christians, I guess. Uh, uh, two things. One is the Changing Church Report is at eauk.org. It's there and the, you'll put in the links, no doubt. But I do think that Merchants of Holy Hope is, I love that. It's a phrase somebody said to me a long time ago, Merchants of Holy Hope, that that's what we, that's what we trade in. That's what we do, this holy hope. I like the, the addition of the holy because I think there's a call to holiness in this season. Um, that we are being called, not, not the kind of maybe traditional understanding of being set apart, but there is a, a purity thing in a healthy way that we are being called to to. To, to purify ourselves and to be purified by God's love, but it's it's got to carry the hope. I think those two, when they come together, are just this incredibly powerful combination, and that will take us into more prophetic spaces, I think, more evangelistic moments, as we are merchants of holy hope in this culture around us. Wonderful. I tell you what, would you mind closing in prayer for us, for those people who've perhaps been stirred up um, to, to really kind of take seriously this this challenge because we were talking about you know focusing on the lost um, as we mentioned earlier and actually 
praying for it, but also thinking, what can I do? So would you mind praying? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, we just say, come Holy Spirit. And we want to thank you for parts of this report that tell us that the church is doing incredible stuff and that people are continuing to meet with you and people are continuing to give their lives to Jesus, that the church is out there helping the most vulnerable. But Father, we pray this will be a moment where the church is, in a sense, turned inside out. And Father, where there is a releasing of everyone, everywhere, every day, that we will see your royal priesthood of all believers uh, just moving out across our land. And Father, we realize there is deep pain and brokenness. There are many who have been personally touched, uh, tragically touched by, by COVID-19. They have lost loved ones. Uh, there are those who have uh, been struck by the illness and have survived, but they're, they're still in recovery around it. And Father, we're aware of other kind of cultural things going on, particularly, Father, around the protests, around race in our culture and in our world at this moment. And so, Father, we pray that the church can be a healing source in that. We're not saying we've done it perfectly at all, Father. In fact, we need to repent of some of the things that we've done. But in doing that, and in hopefully in small ways, ways modeling uh, social and intergenerational and racial integration and reconciliation, Father, I pray that we can be merchants of holy hope, that we can be a light and a beacon to a world around us that is struggling and in pain and anxiety and in fear and in a culture of death. And so, Father, I pray for each and every one of those Christians who are maybe listening today. And, Father, that you will just help them to feel equipped, uh, that they are filled with your Holy Spirit, that they are on mission for you, that we are co-missioning with you in this moment. Father, if there's anybody listening who doesn't know Jesus, I just pray that in this moment you'll be stirring their heart. If they want to do that, they just want to give their yes to Jesus. I just want to encourage them to do that. Maybe check out Alpha online. And Father, I thank you for Adrian and what he's doing and what he carries and the doors that he's opening in this moment. Um, for what he does through his blog and through his various kind of multimedia channels. Thank you for his work and his ministry in this season. I just pray your blessing on him. And thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm Adrian Warnock. And um, I, we, we, we had a great chat. And thank you for joining us. And uh, lots more uh, videos online if you want to watch it. And lots of material at the Evangelical Alliance website as well, including this report. So thank you so much for joining us, brother. Thank you so much, Adrian. Bye-bye.